Thank you. So we've been talking about the food and beverage industry since this morning. I want to take a step back and talk briefly about what would digital transformation look like for the food and beverage industry? What would digital brands, food and beverage brands of the future look like? And to talk about that, I just want to extract the conversation briefly from the F&B industry, talk about digital transformation in general. When we talk about the shift that's happening because of digital today, very often one of the most common mistakes that we make is to think that the shift that's actually happening in the world is a shift from physical to digital. And when we think of that as the shift that is happening, the kind of, uh, uh, the kind of predictions that we come up with is that offline is going to die, everything is going to be online. And as we've seen over the last few years, that's really not happened. It's happened in a few specific verticals. It's not happened across the economy. The second way of interpreting the shift has been that we've thought of thinking about that shift in terms of a shift from software to data, where in the software industry, people started thinking that the key shift that was happening was that business was moving away from software into big data, and that increasingly business would be about giving away software for free and getting data and monetizing that. But today what we're seeing is that all of these shifts from digital, physical to digital, from software to data, all of these things are impacting what we have traditionally thought of as the offline economy. This is what I've been exploring over the last few years uh, and what I wrote about in two books, uh, Platform Scale and Platform Revolution, where essentially what I look at is what is the real shift that is happening in business today. And the key shift that we see that's happening in business today is a fundamental shift in the design of the business. And I want to briefly explain what I mean by that. Traditionally, we've thought of business as moving in straight lines, and that's what I call pipelines. We've thought of business as pipelines. And when we think of supply chains, when we think of traditional media, when we think of the way traditional brands work, they would advertise, they would push products out, and, and a customer would take, it, uh, would take the product at the other end, pay something back for the product. That's been the design of business that we've always seen across the economy, which is the design of a pipeline. But today what's happening is increasingly we're moving away from this pipeline design of business to something that we're increasingly calling platforms. And I want to take a few examples of how this has happened in different industries, come back to food and talk about how this is now happening in the food industry. And it's happening in such, uh, in such a, f uh, a fringe capacity that we don't really see it happening in the mainstream, but we believe that increasingly the brands that will own the industry in the future will all become platform brands. So when, when I talk about platforms, one of the first things that comes to mind is the Apple or the Android platform, because that's something we carry in the form of a smartphone all the time in our pockets. When you look at the platform business, it has a fundamentally different business structure. It does not work like the pipeline business in which business moves in a single direction. Instead, if you look at what Apple does, it creates a platform on which external developers can come in, create applications, and then we as consumers can take a phone and personalize it using those applications. And so the fundamental shift that Apple brings is that instead of competing on phones, it now competes on the basis of this ecosystem. Think of how Nokia used to work. Nokia, Blackberry, all of them used to work in a pipeline model. They would create handsets, they would source applications, put those applications into the handsets, and put out a portfolio of handsets out there. And that's how brands work today in every industry. All consumer brands work in the same model in which Nokia and BlackBerry used to work, which is the pipeline model of essentially sourcing raw materials, packaging it together, and pushing it out to the market. What Apple did was it went away from this whole product portfolio strategy, created just one phone or a couple of variations of that phone, and allowed all of us to customize it on the basis of this ecosystem of applications that exist around that phone. We've seen this happen, this shift from pipes to platforms, pipelines to platforms happen in the handset industry with Nokia, BlackBerry giving way to Apple and Android. We're starting to see this shift happening in the hotel industry where traditional hotels have worked in a way that they've, whenever they've had to expand, they've had to create more rooms, put up more inventory, and Airbnb has worked in a very platform-based manner where it just opens up its platform, allows more than inventory to come on board, and the time that it took Marriott to uh, reach uh, a certain number of rooms, uh, Airbnb reached the same number of rooms in a tenth of that time because of this um, dynamic. What we also see in the case of a platform business model is that as the business grows, it starts growing of itself. 
a self-fueling feedback loop sets in, which is that producers start attracting more consumers, and consumers start attracting more producers. As a result, only a few companies start to end up dominating that particular industry. And that is why a lot of venture capital invests in the tech sector today, because most tech companies that are really big out there today are all platforms, because they start benefiting from this winner-take-all loop where the whole market starts coalescing around one particular platform. One key shift that happens when we move from the pipe to the platform model is that in a pipeline model, the way you, the way you compete with other competitors is on the basis of the product portfolio that you have. This is exactly what I mentioned with the Nokia and the BlackBerry example, whereas in the platform model, you compete on the basis of the ecosystem that you bring around your particular brand and how you allow that ecosystem to start interacting with each other. And when you're running this kind of a business, one of the key shifts that happen is that in a pipeline model, you're focused on improving process efficiency. You're always focused on making processes better, more improved over time, whereas in a platform model, what you're focused on is enabling more interactions in the ecosystem. You're focused on enab enabling more discovery of producers and consumers with each other. That's what Airbnb does. That's what Uber does. That's what Apple does. And that's what all of these platform companies do. When we think about the history of disruption because of the internet, the first round of disruption back in the 90s that happened was all a faster pipe disrupting a slower pipe. So you, if you think of the first few industries that got disrupted because of the internet, the first industry that got disrupted was newspapers. And that is because the cost of transmitting news suddenly fell to zero. The second industry that got disrupted was retail. Amazon disrupting borders, Netflix disrupting Blockbuster, again, because the cost of transferring the product that had to be sold suddenly fell to zero. So the initial disruption on the internet all happened because of a radical fall in the cost of distribution. What we're seeing now is the disruption that is happening because of a radical fa fall in the cost of production, in the cost of increasing the value that you create for the consumer. And this is what I believe is increasingly happening in the food industry as well. Earlier this year, um, Tio, uh, who spoke this morning uh, from Accenture, and I collaborated on trying to figure out what's, what is the kind of platform play that's happening in different industries, whether, uh, which, which are not traditionally technical. And we started to think about what does it mean for brands, consumer brands, whether in food and beverages, whether in healthcare, whether in uh, beauty, whether in um, travel, what does it mean for all of these brands to start becoming platforms? And we isolated it to essentially three kinds of ways in which platforms have come in to change industries in different ways. Two of these are increasingly visible but are not transformative enough. It is the third one that we believe is probably going to be the most transformative when it comes to the future of brands. The first is what we talked about briefly today, which is that platforms allow new markets to be created. And that's what Food Panda does. It creates a new market for food delivery. Uh, we've seen a lot of different cases where platforms have allowed entirely new markets to be created. Uh, we, we can think of that as the Airbnb of food, as the food delivery platforms that are out there, uh, food discovery platforms that are there. There are many different ways in which social platforms have been created to change the way people discover, find food, and consume food. The second way in which platforms have transformed the food industry over the last uh, 10 years or so has been by opening of supply chains, where essentially the disruption happens on the producer side of it. And instead of just sticking to your traditional producers, you start opening up your supply chain and start allowing new producers to come in. So we saw Kraft uh, with its melt-free chocolate bars creating the chocolate bars using an open supply chain. Lint has launched several brands using an open supply chain. And we've seen many different companies doing this repeatedly. So when we looked at this further, what we figured was that one of the key shifts that is going to happen with brands is that brands will increasingly start building consumer-centric ecosystems as well. One of the brands that is doing this today is a company called McCormick Foods. What McCormick Foods does is traditionally it's been in the business of selling spices. And that's been a very simple, fair and simple business. Today, what it's, uh, it's launched a service called Flavor Print. What Flavor Print does, first of all, and we'll see a pattern over here, what Flavor Print does, first of all, is it tries to create a data profile of the consumer in much the same way that Facebook creates a data profile of who we are based on what we are reading. So Flavor Print offers a service where consumers can 
determine whether they like certain kinds of food or whether they don't like certain kinds of food. Think of it as a Tinder for food, where you uh, keep telling the system whether you like certain kinds of food and you don't. On the basis of that, the platform creates a data profile for, the, for that particular user, which determines what kind of food that particular user is likely to like. And at the back end, they've mapped this down into 33 different kinds of tastes. Tastes could vary from sweet, salty, savory, cheesy, whatever. It's a, the, f the flavor profile gets created in terms of these 33 kinds of tastes. On the basis of that, the second thing that the platform then does is it starts recommending recipes to users based on their flavor print. And it starts recommending recipes based on what they're most likely to enjoy. First of all, the recipes that are recommended give a kickback straight to McCormick Foods because all of these recipes use McCormick spices. But that's not really the big game that McCormick is after over here. The, the bigger game that they're moving on to now is they're increasingly creating communities of food where people with similar taste profiles are being connected with each other. They're allowing them to swap recipes. And as a result of that, consumer engagement through so these peer communities in, is increasing. Where they're taking this further is in potentially, eventually building out an ecosystem that allows third-party partners to come in and start serving consumer, consumers on the basis of this food profile that gets created. So think of it in this way. Tomorrow, if you could go to a store, you could look at a, packet, a pa packed food packet from Nestle, scan it with your mobile phone, and it could tell you whether the, that particular food matches your taste profile or not. That is what McCormick is trying to do by opening up an API of this data profile today. Another use case that they're trying to move into is tomorrow you could go into a, a, an online ordering service uh, and start ordering food. And based on this taste profile that is already associated with your login ID, you can be shown a prioritized menu of the kind of food that you're most likely to like based on the taste profile that you've given to the platform. And so this is the direction in which McCormick, for example, is taking the, the whole concept of what brands could look like in the future. Their goal with this being that, one, it's impossible for one single brand to create everything that a consumer is likely to want. But if you can own the single point of access to the consumer, which is the information about the consumer and the, the likes and dislikes of the consumer, then you're likely to pull an entire ecosystem around yourself to serve that particular consumer. Essentially, what they're doing is they're trying to bet on what Facebook did to the media industry, where today media companies individually cannot live without, being, without participating on Facebook. And on Facebook, they cannot participate on their own terms. And that's really the, the play that McCormick is trying to play over here with this particular platform as well. We've seen a similar thing happen in, many, in, in adjacent different uh, industries as well. So if you think of um, the pharmaceutical industry, it works in a model that is very similar to the food industry, where it, there are significant fixed costs to new product creation. But once the product is created, it gets commoditized very fast. So in the pharmaceutical industry as well, Walgreens is doing something very similar to what McCormick has done in the food industry. Walgreens realized that when people walk into their store, they're not just buying medicine, they're giving the store a lot of data. But it wasn't using this data. So as a first step, it launched a loyalty program so that people would start coming back and buying medicines repeatedly from the same store, from Walgreens. This helped them build out a health data profile for these particular patients who would keep coming back to Walgreens. And what Walgreens realized was that patients, especially those who have long-term illnesses, can end up giving a really rich data profile to Walgreens, much richer than most hospitals have. Eventually, what Walgreens has done today is it's created a telehealth platform where it connects these patients to non-competing non partners. It doesn't connect them to other retailers. It connects them, for example, to wellness coaches, to wellness clinics, and allows this whole ecosystem to serve the consumers. So if you look at both of these examples of what's happening with McCormick Foods, what's happening with Walgreens, in all of these cases, what the business realizes is that the brand in itself can only innovate so much. Beyond that, it needs to start opening up and opening itself out as an ecosystem. And to own that ecosystem, it needs to own the consumer information in a way that nobody else does. So this is something that we've seen happen repeatedly with a lot of brands in different industries. I've given you an example of food and beverage and, and one from 
um, pharmaceuticals, we've seen it in health and beauty, we've seen it in travel, and increasingly we believe that this is where a lot of digital transformation of brands is going to move forward. If we look at how things are panning out today, with when we think about how things are panning out today, most brands today build an interactive service to engage consumers. Because most brands, when they think of doing something digitally, they think of digital channels, they think of building an app, some kind of an interactive service. That's usually a good starting point, but that's not the end game in itself. If you look at all of these examples, the starting point in all these cases was an interactive service, which then acquires data, and using that data allows the creation of peer communities around that service. And over time, using that data, it enables the brand to start building third-party ecosystems to start serving these users. There are other examples of this in the food industry where brands have started moving in this direction. So if you think of Kraft with its iFood app, it allows you to plan what you want to eat. And using that data, it then connects you to the closest uh, grocery store that has the right ingredients for uh, planning your meal. And so that's how they've created a whole ecosystem to serve, um, to serve the users. Another example of that is what Coke is trying to do with the Freestyle app, where they've tried to create uh, an interactive service, but they're still, they're, they've still not been using the data to move beyond this. So if we look at this whole journey, most brands today focus on building an interactive service. And that's usually a very good first step. But the real game over here and the real opportunity for long-term sustainable competitive advantage over here is to move that interactive brand to an, an, an opportunity to get more data into the system and then use that data to start creating an ecosystem around the brand.